Welcome back to Humankind. In this video, I'm going to show you, with gameplay and description, my top five militarizing cultures, not necessarily militarists, and some honorable mentions along the way. My first core choice is not the Hittites, despite receiving plus one combat strength for the rest of the game. No, 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 no. It's the Mycenaeans. Here you receive a 20% discount on all of your unit industry cost for the rest of the game. Also, your units basically start with a promotion, which gives them a combat strength. Kinda see why I'm choosing the Mycenaeans, but actually, in many ways, it's their district and unit that really sets them apart. The reason why I think the Mycenaeans are just in general a really powerful pick is because of the Cyclopean Fortress. Take a look. You might think it doesn't look like a lot. It's a great fort at 20% fortification. It provides a lot of stability at plus 15 rather than minus 10 like a normal district. But it's actually the fact that it counts as a maker's quarter and provides industry that has me most excited. Take a look. I can place it anywhere like a fortification, so it can be aggressive or defensive, but it also extracts industry from nearby tiles. So have a look here, it provides 14 industry as well as the stability and fortification bonuses. This is probably the best district in the era. Take a look at what is a reasonable maker's quarter, doesn't even compare, right? 11. 11 industry on this maker's quarter, pretty good, but nothing, nothing in comparison to this wonderful district which is providing 14 and a 25 point difference to stability. This thing is powerful. But also let's not forget that the Mycenaeans have a wonderful unique unit. Why is it so good? Well it's actually not because of its strength. It's not particularly strong. It replaces the warrior. But that's why it's so good. You get it in the very first technology you can unlock, if you so choose, city defense. And this upgrade to the traditional warrior also has the champion unit class promotion, which makes it stronger when it's attacking during the first round of a battle. And most conflicts within the ancient era will be relatively quick. Small fights, one or two units, makes this even better still. It's also really important to note that the Cyclopean Fortress also acts just like a garrison would. You can place it wherever you like, of course, but also it can act as a unit land spawn. Just another thing that makes this district so powerful and really, really seriously makes the Mycenaeans not just one of the best military picks, but actually one of the best picks in the game. They're a very powerful culture, don't sleep on them. Take a look here again, just one more time. Cyclopean Fortress, insanely good. Plus 15 stability instead of the normal minus 10. And watch what happens as I move through turns here. Take a look at this city, it's got 47 industry. Smash out, end turn, boom. Now it's up to 63 industry. I have another new unit spawn, another spot to defend from. So good, so, so, so good. Don't sleep on the Mycenaeans. Let's move through into my next decision. And here really is the Mycenaeans in practice. Your units are 20% cheaper to produce. You receive an additional, effectively an additional combat strength because of that plus 25 unit experience. And you can train them basically wherever you like thanks to your district. It means you can produce some very cheap, strong warriors from basically turn one. And as you can see here, you shouldn't have any difficulty cleaning up even relatively similar powered units thanks to the fact that you can produce these bad boys quickly, incredibly cheaply, and they start with a unit promotion. The Mycenaeans are an incredibly powerful culture. I cannot recommend them strongly enough. I didn't just put them at the start of this list because they're first chronologically, but also because they could actually be one of the best in the freaking game. Do not sleep on the Mycenaeans. My first honourable mention goes to the Huns, with plus two combat strength on cavalry units, and of course a unique nomadic unit that, when it destroys enemies, essentially multiplies and creates more of itself. The Huns are a really interesting pick. They're a little bit different. The fact that they can't build cities or attach uh, outposts to cities is a real weakness for them, for that reason that I'm not featuring them in my main list, but an honourable mention goes to them. Not every culture in this video is going to be a militarist. Sometimes the best militarist culture isn't a militarist at all. And I argue the Romans are just that culture. They're an expansionist who receives a pretty good trait, plus one unit slot on armies, so all of your armies can have one extra unit. 
30% reduced army upkeep, a slightly cheaper research imperial power doesn't matter too much, their arc is fantastic at building influence and stability, but it's really the Praetorian Guard that separates them and makes them a fantastic militarist culture. The Triumphal Arc really isn't a lot to write home about for them. Yes, it provides additional influence and stability on victorious cities, which is hopefully how you'll be feeling, but as you can see, the yield outputs are fairly average, right? Positive stability is great, positive influence is nice, but like I say, really it is about that wonderful unit that the Romans have that really separates them apart. Why? Well, you're moving through the ancient era, right? You've done all the, the research, you've researched most of the technologies. The reason why the Romans are so good is because of the recent changes to standing army. See the swordsman here? That used to be a separate unit from the Romans Praetorian Guard. However, now the Praetorian Guard replaces it. So you get the Praetorian Guard as soon as you move through into the classical era. And at 30 combat strength, it is much stronger than the swordsman it replaces. Plus, of course, its unique upgrade makes it even better still. For me, the Romans, while not a militarist culture, are definitely a top pick just because of that really powerful early unlockable Praetorian Guard that really separates Rome out from the rest. My next hot honourable mention goes to the Assyrians. They're in the ancient era, you could play them straight away if you want to, and even though they are an expansionist, they're very good. You'll receive plus one land movement speed on your units, and some additional combat strength when ransacking for the rest of the game. Their Assyrian Raiders are unlocked very early on, all you need is a horse and you've got a powerful unit, plus the Danu, Granted, this is really just a much weaker version of the Mycenaean district, but it's still a powerful district that you can purchase with influence on outposts as well. The next main pick for me is really only on this list for one reason, and that is boats. The Norse are a very powerful culture. The Norsemen provide plus three naval movement speed on all naval units. Granted, it's Really important to note that that counts all embarked units. Also, an additional two combat strength on your naval units. Remembering that also counts embarked units. Their unique district is unlike any other on this list. It provides a lot of food from the ocean. It is, of course, a harbour. And their unique unit is the Lang Skip. But again, I'm not interested in that. The reason why the Norse feature on this list is because of what they do to embarked units. Plus three movement and plus two strength for the rest of the game. Your navy will be incredibly strong. But also... All of your others will be powerful. Let me just quickly show you what that could look like in a very early setting. It is undoubtedly their power in the sea that separates them from the rest. And you might think, well, what good does a harbour do in building an army? Well, this is literally the ancient era, modded ancient era. I've played no culture before this. I have no religious benefits. And the Norse is providing me with plus 35 food. Now, now that is, is fundamentally important. Why? Because you need food to train our armies. The same reason that the Mycenaeans were at the start of this list is the same reason that puts the Norse here. Their powerful food generating ability, combined with the fact that your boats and your embarked units will literally always be stronger than their counterparts if you play the Norse, because no other culture can provide the same strength that the Norse can provide, you'll be absolutely away laughing. And just to really reiterate it, don't forget that on your outposts, just like the Huns can spend influence to build units, you can spend influence to get a whole load of food, 37 food from a single harbour. And of course, my units that go out through that harbour are even stronger still. Are the Norse the best culture in the game? No. Are they a great pick to add to a military run in a pinch? Or any run involving boats? Absolutely yes. My next honourable mention goes to the Zulu. Now, yes, they're unlocked in the second last era of the game, relatively late in the piece. Are they the best? No, but let me tell you why I really like them. It's not for their district, which is reasonable enough, provides a good combat strength bonus if you're near it. It's not even for Warrior's Pride, which provides 50% faster health regeneration on all of your units and an additional two combat strength. If they start their turn in allied territory, it's actually the impact. The reason being, it does not require a single resource to build, so you can build it as soon as you unlock it. 
and it has the unstoppable combat trait, which gives it bonus combat strength when attacking stronger units, meaning that it becomes redundant a lot slower than everything else because it receives a little bit of a boost against stronger foes. Cheap to build, no resource requirements, backed up by some powerful traits, the Zulu aren't the best culture in the game, but they're a strong militarist pick and an honorable mention for me. If you thought the Norsemen were good, let me introduce you to the Germans. These are, in my opinion, the Norse 2.0. They take the Norsemen and make them really strong. They're an, a militarist culture. They provide three combat strength on your naval units, an additional three if you've managed to play the Norse before them, and three combat strength on air units as well. So moving into the later game, your aeroplanes will be strong, a further 20% discount on unit industry cost as well. That stacks, by the way, additively with the Mycenaean bonus. However, and what is really interesting about the Germans is that they have an industrial district, providing a whole load of industry, and their unique is a U-boat. It is a little expensive for its era and a little overpriced. You probably won't use this too much, but when you combine the fact that the Germans have an industrial district and some powerful bonuses to all unit classes, really, the Germans are an absolutely no doubt in my mind, probably the second best militarist culture in the game, and actually one that could even be used in non-militarist runs quite successfully, whether that's defensively or from their powerful district. The real power of the German co-king works is the fact that it provides plus three industry per adjacent maker's quarter. Uh, and also plus one industry per population. You're picking up the Germans relatively late in the piece. You've probably got quite a good population base because you're having to either train units or frantically defend yourself. This is a very powerful district. It should not be overstated. It is very, very good. Yes, it adds to your pollution. Something to bear in mind, but man, it is worthwhile. And as a militarist culture, there is nothing you love more than being able to pump out your units even faster still. My final honourable mention goes to the Aztecs. Kind of like the Zulu, actually, in that their Jaguar Warrior is very cheap to build, very fast to unlock, and it has fervor, no combat strength penalty for damage. A damaged unit will take somewhere between uh, generally an extra one to four uh, damage every time it takes a hit. So this is quite a powerful upgrade. But also it's worth noting that their trait provides two land movement speed and another unit industry discount cost. The reason why they mention uh, here as an honorable mention is because their Jaguar Warrior is so cheap, but also because you can stack this trait with many others and do some ridiculous things. However, if you find yourself wondering what is the best military culture in humankind, what is the strongest culture in humankind, and why am I not playing Civilization VI, the answer is right here in humankind's Soviets. They aren't a militarist culture, but regular viewers won't be surprised by that. They're an expansionist. Bear with me. Red Tide, 20% unit industry discount cost, stacking on top of what we've probably already picked up a few. You're looking at very cheap units and plus three additional combat strength on all units. However, that is fantastic. Yes, the Red Army tank, one of the best units in the game. 60 combat strength, 8 movement, 6 range, it regenerates health outside of after battles, and it's immune to suppression. It's actually the arms factory though that is most exciting. Beyond everything else in the game, it is the arms factory that excites me the most. Because of that, plus 1 combat strength per weapon on units. Let me tell you about this arms factory. So the way that these arms factories work is they essentially create a new luxury resource, right? So just how, say, over here, for example, we have incense. Incense is a luxury. It provides plus five money. Actually, a better example would be a strategic resource like horses. Once I unlock domestication, I can, of course, improve this and receive one horse, right? The arms factory gives you one gun or one weapon as it were. So at the moment, this is a very early game that I've modded to play as the Soviets from the start. You can see that I have no luxuries at all. Let me build this arms factory, which by the way, is a wonder wonderful district right from the word go, because it gives you five industry and five money and counts as a market and makers quarters, loads of adjacency bonuses. When actually here's a great way to do it. So let me just quickly grab some luxuries, right? So there's one incense. You'll see incense appears up the top right now, so I can see how many I've got. And I'll be able to do the same with the horses next turn. 
and cub. Boom. Horses done, and you can see one horse. However, you'll also note now I'm receiving one weapons. That's what the Soviets do best. This is an entirely man-made strategic resource, and only the Soviets can build it. This is a very unique gameplay feature, specifically for the Soviets. Plus one combat strength on unit per gun is what it gives us. It does, however, cost 10 stability. Unlike all other luxuries that provide stability, the guns, the weapons, take it away. But every single arms factory that you do provides every single unit that you have with plus one combat strength. This can get pretty nuts pretty quickly, as you can imagine. Attach up territories, build more arms factories. Not only do they provide wonderful amounts of industry, and gold, as you can see there, but also, of course, crucially, that combat strength. My scouts at the moment have 17 combat strength. Watch as I move through another turn, we build another arms factory, connecting another weapon to my supply, and now providing an additional combat strength. They're now at plus 18. Of course, if you're playing the Soviets the way the game intends you to do, which is not right at the start, but at the end, you're going to be able to build a lot of these arms factories, and if you can keep up with the stability, you may even choose not to you're going to get insanely strong. They are my number one military pick for this very reason. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.